Right, so uh, I want to uh, break this talk into two parts, actually. The first part is to talk about uh, a little study that we've just uh, completed to look at what it, would, what it would look like to decarbonize the UK's long haul freight uh, with a, uh, what, we, what we've called UK Electric Motorway System, UK EMS. We can probably come up with a much better name than that. Uh, so uh, at the end of that, then uh, you'll see that the first, the obvious first step in this uh, pro process is to do a demonstration uh, to remove some of the barriers that uh, that we need to remove before we can really roll out electric road system across the entire country. So one of the things that we did in this uh, in this study of you decarbonizing UK's road freight was we looked at uh, the UK network, the UK motorway network, uh, to try to get an understanding of uh, where uh, and, and how to roll out the uh, e-highway system. Uh, and we came up with a essentially a three-phase process. Uh, there's a, a zeroth phase, which is a demonstrator phase, which is just a little bit of the M180 here uh, in um, the north of England in uh, South Yorkshire. Um, that's a very small part of the network and it's not really a significant part of the project, but that's the very first step and I'll come back to that step later. Uh, the, the first main phase would involve 3,000 kilometers, 3,000 lane kilometers of motorway. That's uh, 1.2 1.6, uh, 1,600 um, 1, kilometers of motorway or 3,200 lane kilometers. Uh, the cost of that would be about 5.6 billion pounds. And that's based on the costs of the various uh, uh, European demonstrators, the German and Swedish demonstrators, what they've actually cost. And we've based our costs on on their actual costs. And so um, we, we feel that they are a pretty reasonable, uh, pr pretty re reasonable estimate. So about 5.6 billion pounds to do that. The interesting thing about this set of roads, which consists of, you can see the M25 uh, around London, uh, the M4, uh, the M1 and M6, the a14 going across uh, from Felixstowe and uh, some of the motorways up in the north, the M62, the M180, and also uh, this uh, M9, M8, I think it is up in the north between Glasgow, yeah, Glasgow and Edinburgh. Um, the interesting thing about that network is that it covers about almost 50% of the truck of the HGV kilometers in the entire, U in the entire UK. So that's a, a pretty remarkable thing that those small number of roads cover so, such a large proportion of the heavy goods vehicles. By electrifying those roads in 2040, uh, we will have, ident uh, have um, decarbonized, reduced carbon, decarbonized 31% of the UK's freight transport. So that's not a, bad, uh, not a bad score for a first phase. Um, the total uh, of UK freight operating on the motorways is about 65%, uh, 67%. So we uh, decarbonize almost half of all motorway traffic by doing this. Uh, the second phase would go up, in, up into the north of England, would fill in some of the gaps in England, go out to Wales and some of the uh, populated areas of Northern Ireland and Scotland. Uh, that would be another 5.7 billion pounds, uh, 4,700 lane kilometers. Uh, and that would decarbonize, decarbonize a further 18% of the system. And finally, the last segment uh, would fill in all the gaps another 7,000 kilometers. Um, 
another eight billion pounds, taking us to a total of 19 billion pounds. Uh, and that would, at the end of that, uh, cover 97% of all major road kilometres in the UK, and about 65% of all freight would be decarbonised that way, would electrify about 65%. And by 2040, uh, that will be at about 90% decarbonisation. So for 20 billion pounds, we can essentially decarbonise all of the uh, motorway kilometres. And of course, the other, the remaining 35%, that's urban, and most of those vehicles, uh, I'm pretty convinced most of those vehicles will be battery electric by 2040. There's a, a huge move in that direction at the moment. For example, UPS has just ordered 10,000 electric vans uh, for urban deliveries. Uh, so there's, there's a really big move towards electrifying the other 35%. So for 20 billion, we can, uh, we can electrify the UK's road freight. How does that 20 billion compare with other things? Well, it is a lot of money, 20 billion, but the DFT's budget for road construction for 2020 to 2025 is 27 billion. So almost a third more. HS2, of course, which we've just started construction of, is 105 billion and won't uh, bring anything like the decarbonisation that this will bring. So we can decarbonise the UK's trucks fleet for 20 billion. And I would uh, hazard, hazard to say that the level of decarbonisation involved in this, it, this is probably cheaper than any other way of decarbonising any other part of the, of the UK system, energy system. Uh, although I'd be happy to, uh, for somebody to produce the numbers that say that's not not the case, but I think this is probably as cheap as you can get per kilowatt hour of energy delivery. This is an, an, uh, an example of how the, energy, the, the money would be distributed in such a project. We expect that vehicle operators will pay about 25p per kilowatt hour for their electricity. If they pay 25p per kilowatt hour, they'll still be saving a lot of money on their energy costs. So much money, in fact, that they would be able to pay back their investment in their electric truck in about one and a half years. So if electricity was priced at 25p per kilowatt hour, this would be an absolute slam dunk for operators because the payback period would be such that it would be uh, worth it for them to do it straight away. It would save them so much money uh, that they could get their payback in about one and a half years. Typical uh, fleet, uh, fleets run their trucks for five years, some only for three years uh, on first life, some five years, some seven years uh, before those trucks get sold on. So as long as we can get a payback period of one and a half years, it's a slam dunk for operators and they will shift to the system. Uh, of that, in this example, 5p per kilowatt hour would go to the DNO, that would be wholesale price. We've done this calculation for 5 and 10p, uh, which are reasonable, reasonable wholesale electricity prices. 6.7p, which is 27% of the total, would go back, go to the infrastructure provider. And what that would do would be to pay back the infrastructure provider's investment in 15 years. So that means that the infrastructure provision could be funded privately. It could be entirely privately funded we pay back in 15 years, after which time it's all gravy. Apart from the maintenance costs, uh, the, the uh, investment would be making big profit after 15 years. And the rest of 13.2p, about half, would go to the government as tax revenue. And that tax revenue in this example would be sufficient to cover the existing fuel tax uh, that is, uh, that is um, uh, levied on uh, HGV diesel. So that means the government would, uh, would break even uh, in the long term. Uh, and the reason that that can happen is because the system is so efficient. It's so low cost to run trucks on this system. 
it creates a lot of financial headroom. And that financial headroom is sufficient to pay a reasonable price to the DNO, a payback, the truck operator in one and a half years, the infrastructure provider in 15 years, and the government in tax revenue. And this shows you uh, various uh, cases that we, that we ran in this study. I'll just show, explain the one in the bottom right-hand corner. Uh, what this is showing is government revenues. Uh, the left-hand side is the current situation of revenue from diesel. And you can see that as we roll out the phases of the project, which I explained before, the revenue from diesel will decrease because vehicles will become electrified. Uh, and what we can do is replace that with electricity tax. So the green shows the decrease in revenues that the government might expect from diesel tax and the headroom that there is to charge an electricity tax or a um, road user charge or however the government chooses to raise its revenue, that's the, the headroom that's available um, and it's sufficient, you can see there, for the total revenue to reach the current levels by the end of phase three. So we think that's extremely attractive. And when we do the same calculations for hydrogen, for example, we find that instead of uh, generating revenues for the government, the government has to subsidize the cost of hydrogen because it's much more expensive and it's not possible to get that one and a half year payback period for the vehicle operator for a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, and nor is it possible for the infrastructure, for the, uh, the, the price of electricity uh, to be at a, a level that is affordable by the industry. So instead of getting tax revenue, the government pays a subsidy uh, from now and forever for, uh, to generate hydrogen, green hydrogen. So our UK proposed pilot, uh, we, as I mentioned before, and I'll just go all the way back here uh, to the beginning, the pilot here is between Grimsby and Immigham ports on the, on the right-hand side and Doncaster, which is on the left-hand side of our test section. So it goes between Grimsby and Immingham, which are kind of two, port, two ports very near to one another. And I've shown them at the top right of my diagram here. I'll get that out of the way. I cannot see that. But top right of my diagram is Immingham, Grimsby, where there's ports and petrochemical facilities. Uh, Doncaster, which is down at the left, which is uh, across the A180 and the M180, a bit of the M18, and you get over to Doncaster. There's a logistics hub just outside of Don Doncaster at a place called Armthorpe, uh, just off, just uh, up the a A630 from uh, the M18. Uh, and so this is the sort of uh, schematic of our proposed, um, proposed uh, pilot project. Now the colored, uh, the tube map colors on here represent different kinds of journeys. And let me just explain those. The green is a journey which would be taken by a container, container vehicle from Immingham, uh, Grimsby, down to Armthorpe, the logistics facility. And what it would do is the vehicle would run on battery electric power up the A180 till it reaches the e-highway section on the M180. It would run down the M180, charging its batteries all the way. And then it would run uh, down the M18 and down the A630 into Armthorpe. And it would do those last sections on battery power. So it has enough batteries on board the vehicle to be able to do those uh, uh, miles at either end of the e-highway section and it charges up its battery on the e-highway. So it's delivered its containers to Armthorpe. It can charge up its batteries while loading again and run a load back to the port at Immingham Grimsby. The blue is a petrochemical vehicle picking up fuel from the port. Again, battery power down the A180, e-highway down the M180, battery power into Doncaster, uh, down the M18 and battery power into Doncaster where it can deliver its fuel and uh, collect some charge if necessary, drive back again uh, to the port, reversing the journey. The orange is 
an urban delivery vehicle running from, from the logistics hub at Armthorpe, and it's picking up uh, um, stuff for its urban deliveries, running them in and around Doncaster. It can do some opportunity charging in the Doncaster area if necessary, and run back to uh, the hub at Armthorpe to charge and to reload. And in a way, the most important one is the pink one. And the pink one goes from Emmingham to Liverpool or Manchester to London uh, or somewhere else uh, in the UK. And the reason that's important is that we need to be able to um, demonstrate what happens during the uh, transition phase when we're transitioning to the e-highway system and when it will be necessary for vehicles to run on the electrified network and off the electrified network as well. And so it's a hybrid vehicle. It runs on battery power from, Grims from Immingham to the M180. It runs down the M180, charging its batteries up to a full charge by the time it gets down to the M18. It runs on, in hybrid mode, uh, diesel engine, a gas engine, biodiesel, biogas, uh, even hydrogen fuel cell, providing that uh, power to get to the outskirts of Liverpool. And of course, while it's doing that, it's taking all the advantage of being a hybrid. It's getting the opportunity of regenerative braking, uh, of uh, capturing energy on downhill events, coasting, and so on. When it gets to Liverpool, it switches from hybrid mode back to electric mode. It runs into the center of, of Liverpool entirely electric, uh, not generating any um, air quality emissions, any, uh, any air pollution. Uh, it drops its load, maybe does a bit of opportunity charging, uh, then drives back to the edge of Liverpool outside the low emission zone, uh, goes back to hybrid mode, drives back in hybrid to the e-highway and uh, back to Immingham. And so proving that it's possible to work on and off the e-highway uh, in an in integrated logistics way. But that's our proposed kind of concept for the, uh, the demonstrator. Oops. In terms of the objectives, what we're trying to do here is go a little further than the demonstrations that have been done so far in uh, in Germany to go to slightly higher TRL, technology readiness level. What we want to do is really develop a holistic understanding of what we need to electrify the entire UK road freight system, not just the EU highway part, but how that is going to integrate with the whole system, the whole logistics system. So we want to do that in a kind of a living laboratory, test a variety of electrification technology options, in this logist integrated logistics in environment, the environment which includes a port, includes a logistics hub, includes a city center, and includes the, uh, the highway running. We need to verify the operational readiness of this system. We need to prove the business models. I've given you a, bit, a rough uh, view of the business models, but uh, we need to uh, prove them in much more detail for the direct beneficiaries, and the direct beneficiaries are the fleet operators and the uh, and infrastructure providers, the electricity selling company companies. We need to also prove the business case for UK PLC. And I, I gave you a hint of that by showing you the tax revenue benefits. There are other aspects of the business case, of course, uh, which come from running an efficient uh, energy system. You know, it is really the case that if you have an efficient energy system that gives you economic efficiency uh, because you get tax revenue generating capabilities. You can spend that on the health service or schools or whatever you choose to spend it on. Uh, whereas if you have to subsidize a system, then you're bleeding money out of the economy and that money is not available then. Uh, uh, and you have to raise taxes to generate it. Uh, we need to generate the tax gen revenue generation capability for the UK. We need to prove the carbon case, of course, prove that we really are getting 90% carbon reduction. That's what we're predicting at the moment, but we need to prove that. We need to prove the infrastructure safety, the system 
resilience. Uh, that's all obviously critical. It's a, uh, it's a must have, there's no choice about that. That has to happen really at the start. We need to show the compatibility between vehicles in different markets. We need to be able to roam between Europe, between the UK and Europe. And our plan is to show that UK vehicles can run on the e-highway in the UK and in the e-high pulling double deck trailers and then run on the e-highway in Germany pulling normal height trailers uh, and in Sweden and that the charging systems, the, the, the roaming issues uh, and money transfers can all happen properly. We need to prove that the transition to the electric to electric road freight can work and that's obviously a critical thing. There's no point having a vision of a future if you can't get there. And finally, we need to use this uh, study to train the vehicle operators, to train the infrastructure providers, to train drivers, maintenance team, finance and operations team, emergency services, uh, motorway and catenary system operators. Everybody needs at the end of this study to be confident that their roles are achievable and that the system uh, can work. Uh, I won't really uh, go through the timeline in detail other than to say we've developed, we're proposing a kind of a gated proce project, uh, process with uh, planning and uh, scope development, business planning and scope development, product, product pr project planning and construction phases. The key thing here is that we think that if we are to reach uh, net zero by 2045, 2050, uh, in that time scale, then we really need to start building such a system uh, by the second half of this decade. So by 25, 26, we really need an answer about how the UK can go forward on, uh, on uh, low carbon freight. Uh, we'll be past the point where it's possible to uh, decide to not pick winners, to let the free market uh, make decisions. We will have to uh, lubricate the process and make it happen. And we think that needs to be to happen by 25, 26. So this timeline for this pilot project needs to uh, be completed in that kind of uh, time. And we think that's achievable. Um, there's a lot of planning. The construction phase is relatively quick as we've seen today. There's planning and execution phases. We think it's possible to do that in this time scale. We've got some pretty careful detailed costings that have been worked out. Uh, you can see the various phases um, of planning requiring increasing amounts of money. The main phase, the construction phase, require about, will require about 80 million. Uh, the other phases, uh, the operational phase, about 13 million. We've spent a lot of time thinking about all the planning, uh, all the construction, uh, the maintenance requirements, the operational requirements, and so on. We think the total project cost is a near enough 100 million pounds. That's a lot of money. That's really a lot of money. This is a big project for an R&D project, but the benefits in terms of uh, learning are very important because we really need to be in the position by 25, 26, that we can say, yes, we have de-risked this. We know that all of the problems are, uh, are solved. All of the big issues are solved. We know how to build a safe, reliable system. We know how to generate revenue. We know that the business case will be sound and that the carbon case will be good, that the transition will work well and that we can interoperate properly with our European uh, trading partners. So the costs here are dominated by the catenary net and the substation costs, um, but uh, we think that that will all be achievable with, um, within 100, 100 million pounds. So here are my conclusions. We think the only feasible way to get the UK road freight system to 80% plus carbon reduction by 2050 is to electrify the long haul. We don't see any other way to get there. Uh, we don't believe that hydrogen will get there. Uh, and uh, there is no other 
uh, alternative on the table. Battery uh, electric vehicles, we haven't really talked about battery electric vehicles, but the problem is that battery sizes are too big, batteries are too expensive, and the payload uh, disadvantage is too great. It makes it too expensive. It can't be done with uh, an acceptable business case, and it can, certainly can't be done with a one and a half year payback period. Uh, the e-highway, we believe, is the highest technology readiness level of all the technologies available. And therefore, because this is particularly urgent to get going by 25 or 26, we need to focus on it, and not on developing blue skies uh, concepts. It's well tested and proven. It's, relative, it's ready for prime time. We've seen uh, from Professor Boltz's uh, presentation that the, it's at technology readiness level of seven or eight. It's ready to go. Uh, the e-highway strategy, the electric road strategy, gives the lowest energy and lowest carbon emissions possible for, elect for road freight. The e-highway technology doesn't, you know, because when a vehicle is driving on the e-highway, all that has to happen is electricity comes from the wire, comes down the pantograph through a, an inverter and straight into the motor. It doesn't have to go in and out of the battery. Uh, you can charge the battery, of course, but it doesn't have to go in and out of the battery. So most of the time, you've got a direct drive and that will be 80, about 90, 85 or 90% efficient. 85 or 90% of the electricity coming out of the wind turbine will end up at the wheels. You can't be, there is no more efficient way of using green electricity than that uh, in, in vehicle. Even going in and out of the battery, in the battery electric vehicle, introduces inefficiencies and takes you down to about 75% efficient from 80 five or 90%. Uh, so this is the lowest energy and lowest carbon way of uh, transporting freight. That it has smallest batteries. Uh, it's interoperable within, with uh, European projects. It, we believe, has practical rollout and transition scenarios. It has attractive business cases because of the energy efficiencies and full fuel tax recovery. Uh, so. We need a UK pilot in order to de-risk the remaining issues prior to rollout. The aim is that at the end of that pilot, we'll be able to push the button and start on planning full-scale construction projects. So that's all I have to say. Um, uh, I think uh, at this point, we'd be very pleased to take questions for the, uh, the last two sessions, Professor Boltz and uh, myself, and I'll stop sharing.